Okay, welcome everybody. Hi, Liana. Okay. okay, give a few minutes minutes for everyone to join us. Good morning. I'm sorry, morning. I, have, I was muted. In, in oh no, that's okay. I, I have uh, I had mute all on my on my end. All right, right. So that that way I don't have to do whack-a-mole as we're doing the presentation for uh, any uh, uh, place, anyone that needs to be muted. Robin will be right there. Okay. His still still letting folks in. So. Yeah. Um, just excuse me. Um, I think I'm overdressed. It's very hot here, so I'm gonna just. <laughs> okay, no problem. <laughs> Sorry. Advantage of uh, being inside when you're presenting. <laughs> yeah, good morning, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, better to be inside today when uh, presenting since it's, uh, uh, well, <laughs> spring such as it is in the valley, which is like maybe two weeks of moderate temperatures and then wildly swinging temperatures back and forth. <sighs> Always fun. <sighs> <sighs> okay. All right, so we'll be looking at phase four today of the MCU uh, as we'll start in uh, another minute or so. Whew. And the unifying themes of the of phase four, but also a number of the problems that beset uh, phase four, because there were indeed some that uh, afflicted uh, the MCU on a level that really hasn't uh, uh, been seen before. But hopefully they're hopefully they're on the way to correcting it. Uh, at least one thing. So. So. Uh, the infamous echo. Hi. Hi. Hello again. Okay, reduce the sound a little bit. So hopefully that cuts out the echo, echo, echo. <laughs> Aside from the imitation, my imitation echo. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, bat I see the Batman shirt. That could be a Batman could be a whole comic book universe to himself, considering how many uh different incarnations of Batman there have been. <laughs> What is yeah. your favorite Batman? Ooh, oh, that's tough. Um, probably on an equal level, Michael Keaton and uh, the uh, Christian Bale. And, uh, from the from the actors, although Ben Affleck would be uh, probably a close third. I do <laughs> think the Christian Bale version made it more serious, like a yeah almost like a tragic character yeah it was well, certainly it's not tragic because it doesn't end in tragedy but <laughs> but just that the mode it was tragic mode the the noble yeah. orphaned so i mean there's some elements of the tragic hero it it certainly uh, it certainly was darker than say That's the uh, Mike, two michael keaton movies although yeah, well, the Michael Keaton movies were uh, 
distinct in their flavoring. And I mean, it's, you know, Tim Burton, after all, who is, uh, yeah, yeah, very, very unique. <laughs> but I, his, I understand uh, that Michael Keaton is coming back. Yeah, he's doing a uh, guest role in the upcoming Flash movie in June. <laughs> and they're advertising the holy heck out of uh, Michael Keaton because uh, Ezra Miller is not exactly the person they want to uh, be putting front and center with all of the antics and issues that uh, they have had. Uh, uh, accounting for uh, Ezra's gender identification, uh, as he as they prefer to be called they them. Of course, he might well, not. Yeah, he'll not. He may be lucky to have a career after the Flash uh, is done. They're not going to do anything before the movie, but uh, afterwards, I think he's going to be uh, saying farewell. <laughs> And of course, we'll see what happens with Jonathan Majors as Kang. That's still uh, developing. <clears throat> Although that's one of those things that's not within uh, Marvel Marvel Studios' control in terms of uh, what's going on with that. <laughs> and are you looking forward to the Joker sequel? The oh uh, oh yeah, that Lady Gaga. <laughs> Yeah, that, that would be interesting. Well, yeah, she should be, uh, that should be a lot of fun with the uh, Joker, especially because since um, that one's in, in an entirely separate Elseworlds universe, you don't have to worry about um, any uh, studio interference, monkeying with it and so forth. Which God knows with DC has been a continuous problem. Of course, even, even Marvel in phase four had uh, suffered from uh, studio decisions. So welcome everyone to our examination of phase four and the themes that run through it. So setting the stage, uh, phase four was by far Marvel's most ambitious um, stage, according to my count, where there were a total of 17 different productions during the course of phase four, ranging from, you know, uh, early, you know, uh, mid uh, 2020, 2021 with WandaVision to Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, which is pretty much, almost equal to the total amount of movies they made for phases one, two, and three. So setting the stage for phase four, of course, phase three wound up with uh, Spider-Man, uh, Spider uh, you know, the Spider-Man movie where his identity got exposed and so forth. And uh, then the COVID hit. So that pretty much delayed everything and uh, created a number of issues with the productions in terms of how much people could work, how many people could work on set, etc. Another significant change was that there was a new CEO at Disney, uh, Bob Chapek, who is now gone, and Disney Plus was starting. So Bob Chapek kind of had an overall philosophy of quant quantity uh, or, even if it's at the expense of quality. And so Marvel went into kind of a high gear production schedule, far more than they had ever done before. And in the process, we found that even Marvel Studios has an upper limit. You know, they were just doing too many projects at once and the overall quality of a number of the projects did suffer. I mean, most of them to me were still really good, but there were a lot of problems because of just this, they're engaging more productions than ever before. They started doing TV series the first time they did TV series, even if they were like a six part 
uh, TV series. You know, it was uh, a change of philosophy. Plus, they were trying to expand the number of movies released. And so they just hit a ceiling. You know, there was only so much that they can do. Now, uh, thankfully, uh, Bob Chapek is gone. So the philosophy that governed him of qu quantity over quality is gone. And Bob Iger, the former CEO, is back. And Marvel is making changes, which we'll talk about uh, later to try to correct some of these issues that the um, uh, phase four had. But I mean, there's still a lot of good in phase four now to give due credit, uh, this overall unifying theme of grief, loss and recovery was suggested by, uh, by someone else, Armin, from the YouTube channel Comic Book Cast 2. And he did a short video talking about this being the overall theme. And I watched it and go, yeah, you know something? He's absolutely right. So let's focus in on that for this, um, you know, th this uh, uh, time around. Uh, Leon, I think you're muted. Uh, right now. Sorry, I, I muted because my dog started making a fuss. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. All right, so um, you know, we have the theme, uh, one of the central theme is perhaps of grief, loss, and then dealing with grief and loss, and of course, um, that can take a number of different forms. So we had, of course, at the end of phase three, Thanos is a snap, which eliminated 50% of life on the universe. Uh, and then five years later, as they called it, the blip, where the Avengers restored most of uh, the people that disappeared, but five years had passed. So even the, and even though, you know, kind of calling it the blip was a way to kind of, you know, kind of uh, just find a way to uh, deal with it, I think, because how do you deal with, uh, you know, the sudden disappearance and reappearance of 50% of the universe's population? <laughs> and then, but even when the 50% came back, um, things had still inevitably changed. It had been five years, so people had moved on. Uh, you know, uh, you know, husband, um, husbands and wives had gotten remarried because they thought they were never coming back. Homes had been sold, jobs had been shifted. Um, there had been some deaths that uh, couldn't be restored. You know, like in the we see at the end of the. Um, uh, Infinity War, you know, you have planes crashing and everything. Those couldn't be, you know, restored because they weren't wiped out in the uh, snap. Like, uh, of course, that's the foundation with what, you know, Vision, with Wanda Vision, the first overall large storyline that really focuses on grief and loss. And what happens when someone who has a lot of power tries to kind of short circuit the process. I mean, you could get argue that Thanos's snap was kind of cheating, that it rewrote reality and destiny, um, you know, and took a shortcut and cut, you know, altered the fundamental nature of the universe. So the restoration of it was just setting that back. But because Vision had the mind gem removed before the snap, uh, he couldn't be restored. But Wanda, the Scarlet Witch, had a lot of you know very powerful magic. So in Wanda Vision, it portrays her going to the, this small rural community and basically rewriting reality uh, to bring Vision back to her. Um, you know, using magic to kind of rewrite reality, but 
you know, unlike the, the snap or in the blip where things were restored, this, uh, this was only um, maintained by magic. It wasn't actually completely real, or maybe it was. But it was something that she couldn't maintain forever because it, you know, wasn't a rewriting of reality like the blip and the restoration. And it also came at the price of taking other people's lives and, you know, placing them under control um, and stealing their lives away, much like Thanos did. Uh, now, granted, you know, you feel a lot of sympathy for Wanda uh, and, you know, what she's going through, but still, I mean, it's a pretty um, high price to, you know, pay for doing that. Um, you know, what did you think of uh, the Wanda storyline, Wanda and Robin, or Liana and Robin, yeah. I, I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was very touching. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure I completely bought the relationship between. That's what I was going to say. That, that was the weak point. That so as a romance, you know, I don't know. But but as a as a story about loss, I thought it was a powerful idea, and I I I, I, th I thought it worked very well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought it was different, you know, which is something I wanted to see. You know, there's only so many explosions one can handle in most of these yeah. Marvel movies. And if you're a comic book reader, you know, which I was until I was like 12 or 13 years old, uh, like a regular collector, you know, there's there's an alien invasion like every every month, right? There's something terrible that's happening. Yeah. Thanos is engaged in shenanigans every year, right? Uh, so so I, I think that uh, the idea that these movies have tried to talk about something that's um, very human and very relatable, like, you know, loss and... <clears throat> And, and just dealing with the tragedy of missing people in your lives, especially given everything we've been going through in the real world. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think, I think it can work really well, you know, and I, I think yeah. it's, it's been quite powerful. And uh, uh, I, I appreciate that, you know, as somebody really only primarily focused on Marvel when I was a kid, uh, I, I mostly like what they've done with the characters. And I, I think they have great casting and, uh, you know, there are very few cases where I, I really think they've made a, a big mistake. I mean, I, I was just curious, uh, listening to what you said before, David, um, what what do you think? Uh, I understand, you know, the, the uh, pushing out a lot of material, uh, putting out a lot of shows. What do you, what do you think was the weakest? I certainly wouldn't say Wandavision was in that uh, category. No, no, that was one of the strongest. I I think that in terms of you know Marvel did some things to try to like um, you know compensate for that. Um, so for example, they gave directors more control over the final product. So in the case of like uh, Sam Raimi with uh, Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, that worked. But mm -hmm. with Thor Love and Thunder, the storylines they were adapting from the comics, the uh, Jane Foster cancer storyline, the Mighty yeah. Thor storyline, the uh, Gore the God Butcher storyline, yeah. were just not suited to Taika Waititi's directing style, where he even went more kind of slapstick yeah. comedy. It was funny, but the the comic book stories that they came from were much more serious. And unlike Thor Ragnarok, where it was just perfectly balanced, so it, you know, it didn't, the, the slapstick, didn't uh, overwhelm it. Um, th this one, because Taika had more freedom, felt like, you know, it was just too much. And it was too overly comic. I mean, Gore the God Butcher is a villain, just they could have done so much more with him, with Christian Bale in the role. Yeah, it, He was too much of a silly character at the end. Yeah, yeah, I like and I like Paco with the yeah, I like Ragnarok a lot, but I yeah, agree with I you. That was kind of uh, weak. Sometimes I feel he's a hit or miss director. Yeah. I mean, I like a lot of the work he does, but sometimes I feel like he gets the the tone wrong. I 
but I haven't seen everything that he's done. Well, especially in this one, like David was saying, I mean, you know, like if you if you know the comic book story, which uh, I, you know, I, I don't have those comic books, but I, I just follow occasionally some of these storylines because I still love to see what they're doing with the characters uh, in the books. And uh, I think it's a very powerful, so just like WandaVision, right? You know, the, the idea that right, she's able to hold off her cancer when she picks up the hammer right yeah. but right she goes right back into it and she can't get treatment for that cancer so it's it's killing her i i thought that there was a lot of pathos to that that story and uh i i i wish that they had done it if they'd just given it a little bit more of a tragic cast and they'd actually let her die yeah maybe it would yeah, have been I, a little bit more interesting right i i i think it's also this is a, a case where the uh, desire to uh, get as much money out of it as possible also heard it that uh, it's true they're actually your sales yeah yeah thor love and thunder came in at like just about two hours really it would have been some given the nature of the stories i think if it would have had a little bit more serious tone and maybe been about given a, itself about 30 more minutes to really delve into these characters yeah. And the pathos of it, that would have, um, I think, worked a lot better, you know, in terms if of... If you called the God Butcher, he didn't get to do a whole lot of butchery. I mean, you know, like, yeah, I, I, I started disappointed. I'm like, what, what, yeah. where's yeah. The, the God Butchery? And, and of course, the, more, the, the thing that was really lost was the um, kind of moral quagmire that Gore the God Butcher brought in the comic book Thor, which was the notion that Gore was right, that these gods are just so irresponsible and, you know, not really worthy. And, you know, it, it, that was just kind of missing. I think it might have been there at some point with Zeus kind of being uh, so flippant and so forth. But it just didn't resound because there was just so many different storylines put into it. I mean, I still liked it. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm always going to love the goats. I love the screaming goats. Those were, <laughs> those were hilarious. I, I do love the screaming goats. So. Yeah, I thought that was funny. <laughs> but, but I mean, I thought um, Gore's, you know, um, sympathetic side of that, you know, he wants to bring his daughter back from the dead was there, but it could have been, you know, portrayed more strongly. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, look at the price that he, that it took to bring her back, you know, that it's just kind of blown off at the end when he's killed God, Lord knows how many deities that may have been bad, but they may also have been uh, decent ones like Thor, for example, or the surviving Asgardian gods. This didn't, you know, I think that was where like WandaVision did a better job and Doctor Strange when she was there because you really got a sense of the price that people paid for, uh, you know, Wanda's desire, even though it's complicated by Agatha being there and the, that funny number Agatha all along and so forth. But once, uh, you know, we get to Doctor Strange and Wanda has the dark, dark hold, even though she's given up on vision, she's still grieving the loss of her two sons, which, you know, actually seem to have existed, that she willed them into an existence but they both vanished from this reality. And so she goes through and kills all kinds of different people, including versions of herself, trying to um, restore again, like she did with vision, but you know, the price is higher because we actually see it in Dr. Strange, like with the uh, Illuminati who, um, you know, we get to see John Krasinski as Reed Richards briefly, which was a big fan cast. Um, and we get to see all of them just wiped out by Wanda. And what, what's the effect going to be for that reality? You know, they've got some of their most powerful heroes just wiped out. And indeed, all of the screwing with the multiverse, you know, we get the idea that 
this is going to play out with these incursions where entire universes might be wiped out and everybody in them. It's kind of like Thanos on steroids when, when you start having incursions where universes are colliding and everything. Um, yeah, it, but we also see the hope of recovery because at the end, Wanda does come back to herself helping to destroy the dark hold, even at the apparent cost of her own life, which of course it, she's going to be back. So you know, it's <laughs> yeah. not permanent, but it, there was some redemption and recovery there, but still it was a very, very high price uh, to pay. You know, how many, uh, potential wizards and uh, sorcerers did she kill when she attacked, uh, you know, that uh, temple where, you know, they were training all the different wizards and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a grim scene. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I yeah, think... I, I, I like how they always kill all of the multiversal versions of these characters who seem to like go down in like five seconds, right? But in the real, yeah. in the movies, it's almost impossible to kill any of them. <laughs> that's the, that's, that's the val value of the multiverse, right? Well, of course, they don't have time to play it out long term, like. Uh, well, of course, right? something was trying to say something. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Natalia, you were saying? Oh, yeah, because it was like, yeah, it would count, like, how many, like, same with the multiverse, like, it would, like, also, like, count that how many times that, not only have you, like, killed this version of, like, the other version of, like, Z City Avengers or, like, the new version of, like, Spider-Man mm -hmm. or, like, any of these characters, like, that all that I'm saying, like, you have no, like, no one has no idea or, like, no count that, this is something that's gonna happen like in the next phase. And you and I know you guys were like talking about like John Jonathan like Mayers is king. There mm -hmm. was like many outlets and like saying that okay, if someone lives like let's say Marvel was going to like replace him, people have been like dying for like an actor that like, would have like good intentions. But in my personal belief, if they were going to like replace Jonathan as King, I would say that I would pick between John Boyega, who was known for being Finn okay. in the Star Wars, yeah, and then um, another one would have to be um, Daniel uh, Kalaluya. Uh, I know he went from like mm -hmm. Nope and Get Out, which mm -hmm. were like Jordan yeah. Peele's like, um, best right, right. Yeah, yeah. And these movies, like, they talk about like really like intense like topics, like racial and like there's yes. like paranormal things but like it's illusion by like these critical topics like just yeah. with, like, racial issues and i do love that and, and we're def we're definitely that's definitely going to be part of it like um you know the even the very second series um of course was falcon and the winter soldier and you know there are a bunch of doofuses out there who are like so far right that everything is they just view everything from a woke lens and any story that has to deal with racial issues is automatically just woke which is ridiculous i mean there are very badly told stories about racism like um you know some of the cw shows where they just would create a show that starred a, a diverse cast and then just throw it to the wolves and not do anything with it like black lightning or batwoman or naomi or any of these shows that they just kind of it was like i call it like token representation they would create the shows but then there's no support for them there's no connection to the main arrowverse for example and so it, it was just like it's a wasted opportunity you have this chance for di uh, diverse heroes, but in a lot of other cases, you know, like, you know, with John Boyega, he could have had a much bigger role in the, to the two last two Star Wars films. And he just kind of got sidelined. You know, it would have been nice to see him have a more 
bigger uh, a bigger role. Now maybe the story was overly complex and they realized after the Force Awakens that wait, we got too many balls jug being juggled in the air. <laughs> And so that was a significant. Uh, yes, because after- they they made the story more focused, uh, focused more on Ray, yeah, who was the equivalent of equivalent of Luke, somehow, and, yeah. and I guess yeah. they wanted her to stand out more. Yeah, and, and, and they were also upset have- with. The- oh, go ahead. go ahead. We also have to factor in, of course, the passing away of um, Carrie Fisher in the midst of mm-hmm. the you know, most recent trilogy that yeah, certainly yeah. uh, changed uh, yeah. that necessitated a, a lot of different changes uh, with it. And, you know, so there was that, again, outside factors like with uh, Jonathan Majors. I think although one of the strengths of the of Marvel stories is like with the multiverse line with like Jonathan Majors, and I hope he's cleared and stays as Kang because he's a great actor. But the way it, the way it's constructed is that if you had to replace Jonathan Majors, you you could, you know, with with a little bit of rewriting, but still, it's not going to be something, you know, immensely difficult. At least at that at the point they are in the the storytelling. But I would definitely replace uh, Jonathan Majors with some other African American actor, an African American actor or actors, <laughs> maybe as an insurance policy, so you don't have all of your uh, uh, everything riding on one person. Maybe you cast uh, a, you know four or five different African American actors as the main variants of Kang, like Rama Tud, Amortis, everything that we saw at the end of. Uh, uh, Ant Man and the Wasp: Quantum Mania. That way, you know, if God forbid something happens with anybody else, you don't have to, you know, you, you don't have to recast. You know, uh, you know, you can just move somebody else fairly easily into the other one. One of the other variants. It's not all dependent on one person. But, but you know, like with. Like with uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I loved how that really tackled both, you know, personal and racial issues that, um, you know, both uh, Falcon and Bucky were dealing with, of course, the loss of uh, Steve Rogers, Captain America, but they were also both dealing with their past, you know, and their future with, you know, Bucky having to deal with his past as a uh, a, the Soviet assassin, the Winter Soldier, and what he was going to do in the future, given that he does have the super soldier formula, but that he hurt a lot of people in the past. How do you atone for that? Um, and Sam uh, Wilson's going through different issues, but he's dealing with his, you know, his, his African American heritage. Do you take on the role of a a superhero that many of his fellow African Americans view as kind of a symbol of white America, um, <laughs> and of course we have the the uh, inclusion of the uh, of the comic book story the uh, Red Right and Truth, where we had the uh, African American Captain America from the 1950s, who was you know really you know suffered under the experiment and got hidden away and, and, you know, treated extremely badly. But, you know, there, and there was this very extreme bitterness and anger, yet even at that end, at the end of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Sam Wilson has made peace with his new role and uh, is going to take it on because he believes that there is I, the ideals are worth fighting for, even if it's not perfect. That things have to change, as he says, and that you know, fantastic monologue that he has at the end, which is some of the best, uh, you know, issue-driven dialogue or that I've. I've, I've seen it was just brilliantly done. Uh, he finds a way to pay honor and acknowledge the uh, contribution of the African American Captain America from the 1950s. And I thought it was a nice balance that 
there was grief, there was loss, but there was also recovery and looking to a new future, a, a different one, much like, you know, with Black Panther, yes. uh, Wakanda Forever, where, you know, you had a very real grief involved for everyone because of the, you know, of course, the tragic passing of Chadwick Boseman from, uh, from cancer. And so I'm the really glad they didn't just replace it, the actor. I mean, I think he deserved because there was so much mourning. Um, I remember all the kids who were burying their toy or something and they had yeah. funerals. And I, I, I think the only way to deal with that was to incorporate his death into the movie. Yeah. And yeah. I think that it was, although the, the folks that did want T'Challa recast had a number of good point, points about it, about what the character meant to African-Americans and African-American men. But at the same time, you know, given, I thought they found a nice compromise with it, with uh, the original T'Challa passing on, but we also have T'Challa having a son who was also named T'Challa. So the legacy continues. That is so very nice. Kind yeah. of the best. And I um, hope his sister becomes a more important. I mean, I, I really like. Yeah, Shuri. Yeah. Shuri's yeah. cool character. Yeah, her new. Uh, I'm her very new bad status. with names. But, I always say sister. I well, <laughs> well I, I like how, uh, I and e even within the structure of Wakanda, we see, although there's a lot of grief and loss there in both sides, of course, including the introduction of Namor or Namor as he's pronounced, but. Yeah, it's always going to be more given the history of the character. Um, and I, I thought I thought how they handled incorp uh, taking the character of Namor and making him rooted in his, uh, Hispanic in, in a Hispanic background or Native American, I guess, with the Aztecs and Mayas. Since like, technically he would have yeah. been, uh, <laughs> yeah, the actor is Hispanic at least. The, the yeah. character is more of, uh, you know, from uh, uh, Aztec and Maya background, but okay, you know. It's, mm -hmm. you know the comics it's, have stated that it, that Namor is actually Atlantic and as in Atlantis. Yeah, it well, and they and they changed the background of that, which I, I thought was a good. Uh, Nice, you know, Aquaman's from Atlanta, yeah. so it's named name more in the comic, but the way they handled the switch worked perfectly well. But yeah. there was also a loss and grief and the desire for vengeance there. And even Namor at the end kind of looked like he had to go down a new path. But yeah, you know, I like how at the end of Wakanda Forever, Wakanda's kind of reorganized just a little bit that, um, uh, you know, the, they're going to have, uh, you know, the that guy, the, oh, I can't remember his name. Um, part. It was in Mbaku, like, after, like. Yeah, um, Mbaku, thank you, yeah. <laughs> in the comic book, the character's called the White Gorilla. Thank God they don't call him that in the book. <laughs> and you don't even want to yeah. see what the costume was like in the comic book. Oh dear God, thank God they ditched that I costume. Seen that. It, it was basically um you know an an African man wearing a white gorilla hide. It, oh <laughs> it definitely a product of its time. Best left forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> Mbaku is a much stronger character, just being called Mbaku. But I like the division that Mbaku is going to be king of Wakanda, and he can stay there and be there the whole time. You know, they they need kind of need a king in country. I mean, sure, he could have been a great leader, a great queen, but Black Panthers kind of needed other places right now. His and sister so could you, be queen. Yeah, so it, it's kind of a difficult balance when you have the king also having to be the Black Panther because you know they're you know Black Panther might be needed someplace but Wakanda in its current condition needs a leader who's kind of there all the time making sure things run smoothly and they can start recovering and so I thought it's, it's a nice division of responsibility 
and it kind of avoids a lot of the problems that we saw in the first Black Panther, where you know you have a leadership decided by trial by combat, so you could have some madman like Killmonger become the king and pro potentially start World War Three. <laughs> I mean, not exactly the best. I mean, for all of Wakanda's advanced leadership, um, you know, their the way they choose leaders leaves a lot to be desired or can have you, you can have problems with it if the wrong person comes along. <laughs> and then, of course, at when, um, you know, uh, you have the snap where uh, T'Challa disappears for five years and then, of course, his sudden death and they're suddenly left without a Black Panther. He got a raw deal, didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> well, kind of of but I did I did like how they handled it. And it was again a perfect encapsulation of grief, loss, and then recovery and new hope at the end. That um, having uh, T'Challa's son raised outside of Wakanda would give that child the chance to pick their own fate and have knowledge of the outside world and the problems the outside world has, which was something that, you know, a point that Killmonger made that, you know, the child kind of acknowledged was actually right. Yeah, yeah and then, and that's, you but know, it, very, it was- it's, it's a very interesting idea that, that the king can't be the hero that's i'm trying to think to to think of other king versus hero or president versus hero or even captain like a star trek comes to mind that mm -hmm. you know everybody associates star trek each star trek incarnation with its captain but but the heroes are they divide their their <laughs> tasks and it's it's not always the captain that stands out like in Star Trek Discovery, the hero is actually um, starts as an anti-hero. She was she's, mm. she's actually sorry. I I, I moved on to universe, but it's interesting that the king is tied to the to the land. That so the yeah. hero has more flexibility. Yeah, well, well it's a King it's, Arthur idea. Yeah, and yeah. Well, plus, you know, you have the, the kingship. The Lion King, sorry. <laughs> you have like, the kingship the being king wrapped up like in. King versus something. And then we have no idea because sometimes in like, they make movies or like, like stories, they'll like, they have a king that's either to be a hero or a villain. It's destined to be that way. But I think like generally, like most of society it is like half of it's continually just like king and a, a hero. Mm. And it's just like, and it's and it's gonna have like a king that's gonna be a villain like that i've been like thinking of like lion king mm -hmm. like thank you i like i did that yeah. kind of, like brought it up but like this is like a similarity like i could like tell from like conversations from far and wide so i'm like that's what i thought of <laughs> well i and i also in think small it's... communities you can like in um anglo-saxon like beowulf or things mm -hmm. like that you can have the hero becomes king because it makes sense to that very small tribal right. community yeah but yeah, it's in, a tribal in largest structure. Cities, the hero yeah. helps to find the right king or helps to get rid of the bad yeah. king. So it's it becomes much more complex in yes, exactly. the more exactly. complex it's, the society is. Arthur it's versus Lancelot, for example. Or, yeah. yeah. It's and a Gawain. much more complex world you know, within the Marvel Cinematic Universe that once Wakanda kind of leaves behind its isolation, the system of kingship that worked before just didn't quite work as well anymore, especially if the Black Panther is gonna be called upon to be part of the Avengers. And of course, you know, we see in some other cases, you know, where, um, you know, I think another prominent storyline that was kind of built off of Doctor Strange is the you know, use of magic to try to set things back to what they were. And we see like that in Spider-Man uh, No mm -hmm. Way Home, where Peter wants to regain the anonymity that he had and tries to take the shortcut through the use of magic. But, you know, it's also 
reflected that you just can't go, you know, magic is not a, much like we see with Wanda, it, magic is kind of a, it, it, there's a price to pay for it. You uh, can't finesse it. If you cast a spell to make everybody forget, that means everybody forgets. You know, that scene in, in Spider-Man where Dr. Strange is casting a spell and Peter saying, well, I want Mary Jane to remember, I want my friend to remember, I want Aunt May to remember, I want this person to remember. <laughs> yeah. And it just screws everything up because you, ma magic doesn't operate with that kind of finesse. You know, it's a overall blanket solution. There's not the finesse to kind of uh, go, oh, well, okay, Aunt May will remember and this person, Mary Jane will remember and uh, yeah, that's not how it works. And of course that leads to any, the attempt to shortcut much as did with Wanda and, uh, you know, or with Shang-Chi when, um, you know, uh, the Mandarin tries to resurrect his wife by gathering all these magic items and whoever gets in the way, God help them. You know, that results in even more death and destruction, trying to just change what's happened um, in an unnatural fashion that just doesn't, you know, leads to more problems and perhaps even greater loss. And for Peter, it's kind of the loss of everything, you know, that was close to him. I mean, that, uh, you know, the devast, I mean, sure, he, uh, you know, met two other Peter Parkers when, you know, that was one of the great uh, things about that movie scene, uh, Toby Maguire and Andrew Garfield again in those roles. Yeah, that's really it was cool. also, It was also heartbreaking when we see the loss of Aunt May as well as that was a complete surprise. I mean, that was brilliant storytelling. You know, everybody, you know, anybody who knows Spider-Man's origins, like, okay, it's gonna be Uncle Ben, but there's no Uncle Ben. And never once do, do you have in like the comics that Aunt May die, dies and stays dead permanently. So it was just like, whoa. <laughs> you know, and that was uh, definitely uh, a, a devastating emotional blow. Plus, you know, Peter having to, but we also see the ability to recover and the willingness to make more sacrifices when Peter basically says, well, if you can't forget about Spider-Man, forget about me. And, you know, I love that scene with Dr. Strange where he says, I'm not sure that I want, I don't think I want to because he admires Peter so much for being willing to make that sacrifice of his own identity. But, you know, even though everybody's forgotten him, he's still there. So there's hope to build a new future, you know, from the ashes of the old one. Uh, Mary Jane doesn't remember who he is, but a relationship can be reestablished. So, you know, there, there's hope for a new beginning there. Yeah, and again, that was uh, just like Shang-Chi, you know, there's the loss there that uh, in running away from his father and, and reuniting with them, he, the father of, you know, the Mandarin ends up being lost, but Shang-Chi can look forward to, a, you know, a, perhaps a brighter future. Uh, and perhaps organi an organization that was used for bad may now be used for good. Um, and you know the and the message of of the best of them, uh, even in you know kind of the problematic uh, some of the problematic uh, productions can still be very. Uh, Effect, you know, can still be very emotionally effective and even uh, help a person with their grief. Um, I, I remember that, especially with Shang Chi. Um, forgive me, I'll just take a personal story detail detour here. My uh, wife's father, uh, a couple of weeks before Shang Chi came out, passed away in the Philippines, and um, my wife was unable to travel back because of all the COVID restrictions mm -hmm. and everything. So we had to do That's kind of all the funeral services and grieving from uh, uh, virtually. 
So when uh, yeah. uh, she's from the Philippines, so when we went to see Chung Chi, um, the whole storyline about honoring the, her ancestor, the ancestors, and uh, it being so rooted in Asian culture was extremely powerful for her. And I think it did help her to express some of the grief that she had been holding inside. I mean, I know people in the audience must have been wondering what's this woman doing bawling so damn loudly in the, one of the front rows, but <laughs> you know, that was, uh, it, it was a scene that was emotionally effective and especially meant something to her. Um, unfortunately, it didn't have an alligator version of, her, of uh, someone to make us laugh like in Loki, Loki season one. <laughs> What Although do you he, think of Loki? I mean, um, does I, uh, this trend of select, uh, you know, isolating one character or two characters and making a whole show? I think sometimes it's it's a very good way to, you know, to create to to go. Um, sorry, what am I trying to say? This um, basically to give depth to a character that they don't have the time in or space in a movie to do. Yeah. So yeah, I think I think um, what's things like WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, uh, the Hawkeye series, Miss Marvel, Moon Knight, really demonstrate the series format at where it it can really shine. You know, like Tom Hiddleston is a great actor, but you know when he's part of an ensemble cast, uh, it's kind of hard for him to completely. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, shine in the I, Loki series. I personally don't like the ensemble ones much. <laughs> so it's, you know, my preference is to have strength of characters, and and if there are too many, I think it everybody gets lost in the shuffle. Yeah, and I, although you know, it can work, and but still, you have to have more. Uh, you have to have. Uh, time to to create character that i last week we were talking about walking dead versus uh, last of us yeah. and i was praising last of us for focusing on for doing more yeah. building a character and that's a i mean x-men they had a uh they had several movies to be able to develop the yeah. character so character development <laughs> it has to be done and, somehow you can't just drop all the characters in there and yeah, hope that Although with the X-Men movies, you could argue that their character development was <laughs> inconsistent, except maybe for War Logan and Deadpool and uh, or the characters that were developed in one movie weren't picked up in another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, each character deserves development somewhere. Yeah. So yeah, I, now and because I think streaming that, services, are, streaming channels are so popular. Why not? Why not develop the character? But you have to have yeah. somebody strong who develops the the show. I, I mean, I'd like to see Rogue. I'd people. like to see Rogue come back as an. I mean, I think yeah. she's a fun character, and I, I, you know, I had mixed feelings about the original Rogue in those Sony films. So I'm I'm curious what they do with these X Men characters when they reboot yeah. them. Well. And I don't know why uh -oh. they like you know the scree the Cree scroll war you know which is you know what the, uh, allegedly right uh, David that's what they're going to yeah. focus on. I never thought that was the most interesting storyline in the comic book, but if they really wanted to introduce the X Men, uh, I'd like to see I, them. You know, like it'd be interesting to see like a conflict between the mutants, yeah. right, who are yeah. are perceived early on as a threat. And and the rest of the uh -huh. existing characters in the MCU, and uh, I think it could be a more interesting storyline than um, maybe Civil War in some respects, yeah. right? But like the Mutant think, Registration Act and all of that. Kind I think of, for, I think they might do that in the in the future, but I think the from one of the ma major stories that I've heard, and I think will probably happen is that in Secret Wars, um, the uh, 20th Century Fox X-Men characters are going to be a major really? part of that. <laughs> and there was speculation that the main conflict within the movies may come down to the MCU, our M the regular MCU characters versus the X-Men characters from the Fox universe who are trying to preserve their reality. And so that will kind of be 
that will enable the characters from 20th Century Fox to come back one last time and have their uh, last hurrah and a good send off, including uh, Rogue, who was you know really a standout in Days of Future Past. Sure. And hopefully she comes back. That same actress comes by, back and fills a, and takes up the role in Secret Wars. It'll be nice to see Hugh Jackman in Deadpool three, for example. Yeah. But then he said he was I, done with it. But I, I think the no, um, <laughs> I think the um, one of the issues that the MCU has had is that so many of their individual movies have ended up being huge ensemble casts. You know, especially when you start like getting into Doctor Strange, although I think that was really good. Uh, but yeah. more like Thor, Love and Thunder, it was like this ensemble group. And that just kind of gets overwhelming. Yeah. yeah, so I think it's good they're taking a step back and slowing things down. And, you know, they're going to use the TV shows and do more individual specials like Werewolf by Night and Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special, which both worked, I thought, very, very well with a much tighter story, a much more focused story. And just, you know, you, you don't see any other characters from the MCU, for example, in Werewolf by Night other than new ones. And so that really helped it focus and the writing could be much more focused on it. I mean, and, you know, they're also going to, you know, not be tied down to any exact episode count, which uh, you know was like one of the issues with She-Hulk, where some of those middle episodes felt like, yeah, come on, guys, did we really need this episode in there? I mean, I liked it overall. Sometimes it just felt like the middle dragged a lot. I thought it might, maybe it would have been better of six episodes instead of nine. I wanted to say one more thing because it just came to mind as we were talking about the ensemble, the ensemble movies and um, the issues with why is it overwhelming? And I, I, I just realized that with X-Men, from the very beginning, it was an ensemble story and yeah. each character had one specific task like you blow up stuff you see through mm -hmm. things you do this you do that whereas the other ensemble um stories are kind of putting together like if you imagine different football teams or different sports teams and each yeah. has a star and then you take all the stars and put them in one team and it just doesn't work because everybody yeah. wants to shine and everybody sometimes they have the same purpose and then they kind of overlap yeah. and then you just don't know who to watch yeah. and it just becomes overwhelming to your senses to sensory yeah uh, and, and that, what am i even watching and why do i care yeah and that's one of the kind of the fundamental differences in the characters the x-men were always introduced as a team as you know they're mutants so they're all unified by that the fantastic four is a family same thing like with the Inhumans, the Guardians of the Galaxy were introduced as a group, whereas yeah. the Avengers like, like composed of individuals. And so it, it kind of makes it tougher to, 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 to do, you know, whereas something like the X-Men or Fantastic Four, because they're thought of as a unit already, it makes it uh, kind of easier, an easier story to tell. And like I said, each one has, each of the X-Men had their own separate unique powers and their own unique role. And almost like a ship, like a Star Trek comes to mind because that's a contained, a contained world uh, or community where everybody has a task to do and you know this one is the engineer this one is this, this but when you put together heroes you know it's even in greek mythology it wouldn't work that way if you put theseus with Hercules and with each of the heroes who would be the hero there would be too many uh, yeah, so you, i think they need some... to think through their first of all their relationships have to work they have to have chemistry and they have to have a rationale for liking or not liking each other they have to have some history together like loki and thor have history together yeah. but 
Thor and, you know, pick another one. Uh, uh, Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel or uh, Iron Man or, you know, yeah. why would they even, how would they mm -hmm. interact? I don't even know. I can't, each of them would be, have a, I mean, they just have no chemistry because they don't have a history yeah. together and you don't understand how their relationship works. Are they, could they be friends because they do the same thing? Could they be, would they be enemies? Would they be, there would be, of course, an ego kind of power yeah. struggle. And, and that's why but some of those, not, yeah, the, at the least show the one. power struggle, which they showed a little bit, but yeah, it's hard well, to I mean, create an ensemble piece. Yeah. And with the power struggle, I mean, you also have to factor in there. So I think a lot of the focus to that went to like Captain America versus Iron Man. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, because of their individual power sets are kind of on an equal scale, whereas uh, Thor is like, uh, in terms of power, um, Thor is not going to, you know, leave Iron Man and Captain America in the dust with all due respect to those two characters. I mean, just, you know, you know, he, he he starts off as a thunder god and then he ends up with the power of Odin inside him. So it's just like this, you know, in terms of just sheer physical might, oh boy, yeah. <laughs> but I, I thought like Black Widow was, the Black Widow movie was one where they did well introducing the different characters. Of course, they were all united by being kind of related to each other and family members are related to how the kind of career that, uh, uh, Natasha had before she became a hero. Uh, but I, I thought that where you have characters who have similar backgrounds or are somehow connected, that makes the introduction of them easier than kind of, uh, oh, we need to shoe in door, Daredevil here. I mean, it was cool to see him in She-Hulk, but you know, it was kind of felt like it was kind of forced a little bit. And then of course, you know, um, you know, again, an area where the, you know, the director's choice was interesting, but it didn't quite fit in well with, was like with Eternals. I, li I like the Eternals movie, but it wasn't as engaging as some of the others. And I think there was a case where you had too many different characters being introduced. You had this whole race and there's like seven or eight as opposed to like Guardians of the Galaxy where you had five for the first film. Or Fantastic Four where you'll just have four, you know, of course, main characters. Uh, yeah, the Eternals was a disaster pretty much. Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I do admire the fact that Marvel one. stood stood by Chloe Zhao even though it didn't deliver what they wanted. I did I greatly admire how Marvel just kind of stood by her and amidst all the criticism, they didn't throw her under the bus, like has a tendency to happen with Hollywood flops, you know, Shazam, Fury of the Gods, where they, it's not even the finish of the opening weekend and they've already taken out the long knives and are stabbing each other in the back. <laughs> <laughs> Like a, yeah, the know, Eternals is like a good example, right? That's a textbook example of too many characters, not enough development. But the director is really a pretty good director. I mean, I, I saw the other yeah. movie that she she won an Oscar for, right? I think, or she was nominated. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't think it's her fault, but I, I, I don't no, know I, that. Uh, it, I, I was asking I, a lot. That script was demanding like a full three movie character arc, right? Within one movie. Right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think too. This is a product of the in, increased schedule. That whereas before, when they had a slower schedule, they might have caught some of the problems with the Eternals and worked with Chloe Zhao to kind of uh, fix some of those things. But because they were on such a hell bent for leather pace, because Disney wanted stuff for Disney Plus, but the company was also trying to help recover from the pandemic. And so despite their best efforts, they just couldn't give the individual attention to the screenplays that they did before. Now, I mean, now that they've slowed down, we're starting to see this uh, slowing down of production to try to get, improve the quality. So the Blade film has been significantly delayed, but 
it's because the script is being seriously rewritten and improved to make the movie actually have a better shot at being good. The Fantastic Four is undergoing a major rewrite because, you know, they looked at the script and said, you know, this just doesn't quite work as well as we'd like it to. So let's bring in some more experienced script writers and get a new version of it. Thunderbolts is being extensively rewritten to try to make it more of a team movie and balance itself out. So I, I think they're taking very positive steps to kind of try to fix these issues and work more with the actors and the directors and the talent to improve the overall quality. I mean, the special effects suffered. And, you know, a lot of it was attributed to one of the chief executives, Victoria Alonso, who had developed some very problematic relationships with the special effects people. I mean, it's a complex story. Uh, just yesterday, Marvel settled with her out of court or Disney settled with her out of court for her firing. So she got a nice chunk of change for that. But again, hopefully they can slowing down the pace will get us back to the higher level of quality. And I think that's going to be, uh, you know, what really, because, you know, one of the things I'll give Marvel credit for is that a lot of studios, when there's problems, they just go, ah, pff, who cares? Let's just keep on going. Even if this movie doesn't work, well, we got two that'll coming out that'll make us money. Pff, but, you know, quality schmolity. But, you know, now we have a, a studio that when they did run into problems, they actually try to take care of it. Now, it might not always work perfectly, and there could still be some bumps in the road, like Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, that just didn't feel right. Like they were, again, trying to do too much. And, uh, you know, rather than Ant-Man being the char main character in his family, there was so much time devoted to Kang, which was, I mean, Jonathan Majors was great in it, but it, it, it you know, it sacrificed what made the first two movies so fun for, you know, kind of g going a different direction the third one. It got him, it was good to take the shot and be very ambitious, but it didn't quite land the, hit the landing. I, again, I kind of wonder if Ant, if there would have been a changeover yeah, change. even sooner, if uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp could have been, helped significantly with taking a little bit more time but you know there were some there's some films that you know there's it's just you know they're they were already done so you have to you can't redo everything and certainly with whatever happens with jonathan majors um <laughs> it could be some heavy redoing of you know i think the only thing that might have to be a major revision if he's if things get really, really bad would be uh, Loki season two. But yeah, <laughs> um, you know, and uh, I thought, I did think Hawkeye worked very well. That I thought that was well balanced. Well, it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought and it was fun, and, right? I think that's like the ideal for like one of these superhero shows, right? It's, it was sort of light, but um, there was character development. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting. It explored right Hawkeye's character a little bit. Right? It introduced that new character effectively. Echo, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Echo was cool. Um, I'm curious. Like, uh, there are things. So obviously, I want to see Doctor Doom. Right? Somebody was just commenting on it. Yeah, I want to see Doctor yeah. Doom's introduction. Um, I'm curious about how they're going to handle the darker characters. Um, you know, I, one of the characters that I liked, although now it's it's become a little bit problematic, is the is the Punisher, right? Um, yeah. I, I was kind of disgusted to see people on January 6th wearing those Punisher logos yeah. and um, yeah. just like Captain America or what. But um, 
you know, the, how are they going to handle a character that's as dark as the Punisher? Um, Moon Knight, of course, in the comic book is a lot more yeah. disturbing than he was um, represented in the show. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I hope they keep the edge of some of these characters yeah, without I, you know, necessarily making them very violent. But, you know. Well, I think uh, from, I mean, of course, Disney, Disney Plus now has an adults uh, only level to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to be R-rated movies. But from what I understand with The Punisher, one of the ideas I've heard is that they'll kind of have The Punisher be doing more with the supernatural side of things. So, for example, you, you can have The Punisher blowing away all kinds of monsters that have like uh, green goo coming out of them. <laughs> and it doesn't have the, quite the same effect as The Punisher mowing down a whole bunch of mobsters. Yeah, that seems like it would be kind of lame. But, like, I mean, if you remember Daredevil season two, I thought, you know, that was an amazing, like, there's a really, it's a really ugly, incredibly violent sequence right in the prison. Yeah. But I thought it managed to capture, you know, more than most action sequences in these movies. It captured the kind of capacity for violence that that character has. And, and uh, you know, uh, the Punisher is an anti hero, right? He's not really meant yeah. to be seen mm -hmm. as a straight, heroic figure yeah. so it'll be yeah it'll be interesting to see what they do if they can yeah. do it in an interesting way with the punisher i know that he's be, you know he's associated with the hand right now and all this i i don't know much about that storyline it seems kind of silly but but i don't i don't know enough about it yeah the punishers it was a fascinating character i mean he was introduced originally in amazing spider-man early on just kind of as a villain and because he was going after kind of like other uh, other criminals because of the way the high level of crime in the 1970s he kind of became a reflection of that like desire mm -hmm. of somebody who would go out and do something about it uh about these crimes that the justice system was just in the eyes of many failing to do ironically it seems like we're back to that time again that the, in a lot of cities, the clock seems to have uh, the gone full circle, and we're back to that era of high crime where uh, political officials and the and uh, prosecutors, in so many cases, just kind of turn away and turn a blind eye to what's going on. Which, you know, of course, it wouldn't surprise that well, the seventies were pretty or, bad. I mean, I'm from, I'm from New York, you know, um, New York City in the seventies. <laughs> really was that there were a lot of homicides uh you know yeah. but if we compared uh new york not even to the 70s but new york today to new york in the 1990s there's no comparison right i mean this idea that there's there was a post-pandemic surge of violence but i'm not i'm not so convinced by this fear-mongering that there's a massive crime yeah. crime has been going been up but I don't know that it's, you know, we no, don't know why that not, trend is occurring and, and, and we have to kind of see what the reasons are for it. it. It's not it's not like it's, it was in the 1970s. I mean, it, no. it's not back to the old uh, grindhouse adult bookstores in the middle of uh, Times Square. <laughs> I don't think it's, no. I don't think God that was forbid still there New in York. The 90, that was still there in the 80s, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God forbid that New York goes back to that level. Man, that would be a slide back. I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, Real no, estate's not, too expensive not, these days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, to the, not to the, you know, as bad as it was in the 1970s now. But uh, there's still going to be the appeal of characters like the Punisher. And that's something Marvel's going to have to to handle is the, you know, how do you do with these very much darker characters because you know yeah. you, you could have the and a pun a standalone punisher series is one thing but you can't expect him to like appear in a spider-man movie and and, and spider-man to just sit there and let him mow down all kinds of different villains <laughs> right right yeah I, you know but, i you know, I, just, I want one something i wanted to come back to is also just like the like, like, you know, this notion of like pe people complaining about a black Captain America. Or, I, I think, you know, for those people who know the comic books um, and the origins of a lot of these characters, especially Marvel, um, you know, a lot of those characters were invented to try to comment indirectly on 
cultural change, uh, racial changes. And uh, I think that it's it's a sad thing that Marvel fans today, there's some minority, I mean, I know it's a minority, but there are fans out there that are putting these sort of racist uh, prescriptions for these characters. I mean, the yeah. X-Men, before, before Storm was introduced, right? I, I forget exactly when Storm as a character was put on the team, but um, it was an all-white team, but it was still meant to be a stand-in for all of the people that are excluded by the majority yeah. and and I, I think that's why people love that comic book so much uh and yeah. you know i think that's why uh the x-men still have an enduring popularity as the outcasts yeah. and uh you know like all this talk about woke this and you know like you know i i think a lot of that is just you know nonsense if you know these characters and um the marvel characters had angst because they were yeah. rejected because they were outcasts. Yeah. The reasons I, don't matter. You're supposed to identify with their being the outcasts, right? You know, and and the racial I, stuff. I think Marvel has always done a pretty good job of of avoiding those yeah. pitfalls. Not always, I, but I think the modern com the modern print comic books, the story, of the writing has kind of suffered in being a little uh, too simplistic and these issues being addressed in kind of a simplistic manner where it's all, you know, uh, all good one side, all bad another. Uh, that's why I like, you know, the Marvel Studios approach, which has been uh, as a whole more balanced. But I mean, I think there's been a lot of really poor writing uh, in terms of, you know, like the create, like the Witcher series where the, uh, the showrunners and the head producers openly express contempt for the the writer and for the characters and say that because the character is a, a white male that they need to be denigrated hmm. or uh, shouldn't be featured as much. I mean, that hmm. I think I think that's the kind of stuff that's bad storytelling. Hmm. That you can tell great stories about characters of all colors with out denigrating any individual group. Yeah, and I mean, like, 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 like the controversy about the Little Mermaid being being black. I mean, first of all, mermaids aren't real newsflash, yeah. right? You know, like, so, so let's just kind of have a reality check here on these characters. I mean, these are fantastical creations. Uh, the and, uh, the and, very idea that you're applying racial yeah. rules to. The, I mean, yeah, one of and, my favorite Spider-Man movies is you know Into the Spider Verse, and I'm really looking yes, forward to exactly. the new one. And I, you know, like, I I just think and, that. Uh, most of the fans of these movies are not, you know, puffed up with these racial, you know, yeah, prejudices. My, you know, my main yeah. concern is, is that can the person act? Can the person sing? That's pretty much, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, <laughs> as much as I worry about it. I mean, there are exceptions, you know, uh, um, you know, but, you know, the, the, you know, getting into the whole transgender issues that are currently going on with women's sports and everything. That's a different, uh, mm -hmm. different topic and a different situation. But, but I think entertainment has a, an obligation to, to pick up on what's going on culturally and address it somehow. I mean, yeah. I, I wouldn't mind it if, if a show tried to, to pick yeah. on that well, sensitive all issue. I, all I ask is that they do it well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, I, just, I don't I don't care if you know you have a racially diverse fantastic four I just want people who can do a great job and sure. you know I don't care what color the little mermaid is I just want the movie to be good sure that's that's all that matters I just want to tell have a good story told have a good have, have a good entertaining movie and if it happens to go above that that's fine just give me some good entertainment that's not jingoistic and wants to make one a point about one side story first issues either yeah yeah story first message second there's nothing wrong with sending messages but always put the story first and the yeah. actors i mean like it doesn't matter what the 
background of the actor is, right? If the yeah. actor is able to communicate something about that character, and, you know, yeah. most of these characters, are, you know, they're not that complicated, you know, it's not exactly King Lear, right? So so you just need somebody yeah. who's able to project the fundamental, you know, angst or problems of this this figure and and uh i just it just makes me sad as a as an american as a comic book fan that yeah there is all of this talk about race in a in an arena where i really thought that um they were doing some progressive stuff about getting past race and trying to think about character right I and mean, I, I, when I was a kid i yes. love those heroic stories i mean yeah yes, I didn't think about to begin the with was a commentary on people who are different, right? The X-Men, yeah, for yeah. example. It was a metaphor at the time when you could only use metaphors for yeah. discussing Un rape. Unfortunately, yeah. the extremists on both sides have really kind of uh, dominated the discussion, whereas you know more of the middle ground has tended to be pushed to the side where the sides are getting ever more extreme to the point where, you know, you can't, any, any, racial swap of a character is is an example of wokeness whereas you know like in captain america sam wilson was captain america for for a while now of course steve rogers is still alive in the comic but you know in a live action retelling you know you, you unless you're going to do like batman dc has with batman where you're just constantly introducing new bat people you know new new characters as bat new actors as batman which is fine that's fine <laughs> i mean it, it can that can work but you know but if for you're going to it work very well to put them all together right the different spider-man actors and yeah that was that was one of the best movies that combined uh you know different i mean yeah. i haven't seen a lot of movies of that kind but it was good i mean it was a very good story yeah. Plus, again, the black Spider-Man also worked very well. It was a, within, a nice example. It, again, it's within well. telling a good story. It's the same example with the boys, where you tell a good story. Now, of course, in the boys, you have the, you know, these superheroes that are like deconstructions of the Avengers and Justice League, that they're just like, what if the Justice League and the Avengers were a bunch of complete a-holes? <laughs> but, but I mean, and that's why the boys work. Which, in the real world, have... is more likely to be the case than these kind of yeah. Boy Scouts and you know people who <laughs> always want to get the cat out of the tree. And you know, I mean, I mean, that's why people like the boys, right? Because it, it actually takes characters that are like the Avengers, right, and makes them somewhat more believable. Right? Yeah. Well, and it's also intended to be kind of a comedy, a very dark, twisted comedy. Yeah, it's as a well. black comedy. Sure. And it go it goes where you know the other superhero productions won't you know where the superheroes are just a bunch of complete douchebags <laughs> and but that's something that's completely uh, different yeah and again you know, if you tell the story well it can it can work. You know, good writing is a solution to a lot of these uh, issues. But you've had this philosophy in Hollywood where is where everybody has to, you know, portray things very simplistically, and there's been too much desire to follow that pathway or to overdo it, like. Um, I like Star Trek Discovery, for example, but in the fourth season, it was just felt like, oh my God, oh, that everybody was the worst on this season ever. playing therapist. Oh, uh, it's, it's gone downhill. Well, right. That season should be just dismissed from the history of Star Trek. <laughs> I'm <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah. Because it's, I like it's not, it's not because so it's much. woke. It's just what, like terribly written. It's more could, like watching as yeah. the world turns. Everyone's giving each yeah. other hugs. And, oh. like, I don't have any patience for it. Just pain <laughs> by numbers. Every episode, yeah. every single episode. It, just it, it sad. Like the, first the first couple first of seasons thing. of Discovery were pretty, pretty amazing. I thought pretty yeah. badass. And you know, yeah, it was like the first season. It was like the first season of uh, ne Next Generation, where. Uh, <laughs> It was just like ah, bad writing. At least it was a novelty at that time, but now it's just 
why bother to, just to have a season? And well, and the next generation got better. I mean, once Gene Roddenberry, with all due respect, retired, the quality of the next generation skyrocketed. But I mean, the first season, if it wouldn't have been Star Trek, it would have been canceled. <laughs> but yeah. like Discovery, did they change the director, the writers? The, what yeah, happened? I, I yeah. think that might have been part of the case, but... Like it went from they, Battlestar Galactica to to first season of Next Generation. Yeah, they kind of <laughs> lost their. I thought season three was okay, but I think when they kind of lost oh, that mojo but... where they were, uh, you know, really in something dramatic, um, and they and they had to, I think, work harder telling the stories in season one and two because. It was set within Star Trek continuity, so you had to work hard to kind of fit it in with everything that was going to happen because you have a certain time scale and you have to explain, well, Mr. Spock has a sister? Why didn't we know about that? So the writing had to be more careful and edgy to um, compensate for that. And then when they get 900 years later and they have an open an open field with which to run with and it's no so limitations on storytelling, it may, they may have gotten too relaxed. <laughs> yeah. you know, Plus the main character now is Captain. She, I mean, that I think ruined, ruined it to some extent because she has, she's more con confined to, to rules and regulations when she was a rebel. And that was yeah. the fun of it. She was always breaking those rules and now she, She's always the straight guy, the straight man. Well, the fifth season will be the last, but it looks like the fifth season is going to kind of transfer over to doing more of a strange new world type where it's uh, an episodic uh, type rather than, um, you know, kind of this one overarching, you know, front, you know, see, um, all, we have this one big overarching story. Um, and it looks like Paramount Plus is trying to make changes to it too. We're going to have Star Trek, Star Trek movies now on Paramount Plus that will uh, also be in conjunction with different series. So I think, the, again, there's going to be, uh, uh, they're retrenching the story, the storylines into a format that will hopefully work better. Yeah, you know, um, uh, it's good. Yeah, it, it's and you know, so people are maybe studios are following Marvel's example that way in getting themselves entrenched and uh, seeing what's wrong and trying to fix it. I'm still waiting for Janeway to come back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'd like to see. Um, I'd like to see her back, not just as a voice character in Prodigy. Yeah, but, but is um, it an, an actual, you know, you know, I mean, if you can bring back uh, the card, you could certainly bring back Cisco and Janeway. I mean, if we're going to bring back captains, let's see you how, know, see what uh, Captain Cisco is up to from Deep Space Nine and uh, Admiral Janeway, too. Yeah. Because, yeah. I mean, it, it would be fun to see those characters. Amazing. Seven of Nine's return was amazing. Yes. Watch that I, uh, episode yesterday. So. I, I haven't. I haven't watched uh, all of Picard season three yet, but the first two episodes. Yeah, I'm kind of trying to savor it like fine wine, but I just love the. Uh, <laughs> I, well, we should really spoil it liked, for you then. With the yeah. first two episodes, I've really liked. i really liked where they're going. You know, it feels more like uh, the old Star Star Trek Next Generation when it was at its best. Yes definitely amps that up so you got you got something to look forward to <laughs> yeah it's done very well won't yeah. say yeah. more <laughs> and i will say i am going to i am definitely looking forward to seeing uh, Mich uh um michelle yo coming back as emperor empress Giorgio in the section 31 movie i think that's another thing that hit um discovery pretty hard is that when Empress Jojor, when Michelle Yeoh's character was there, she balanced out all this uh, touchy-feely stuff 
I mean, there were still touchy feely characters, but when Georgiou was there, she would go, Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. She was always there to like make, um, you know, uh, um, sarcastic remarks that kind of got that nice balance there. And when she was gone from the third season, it just got, oh God, everybody's yeah, going to go start hugging each other. But they love, well, losing her character was bad for the show. Yeah. Yeah, I think she, I think her badass attitude really just kind of, uh, disturb that balance that uh, she had had, that she was there to counterbalance it. And she's so talented as an actress that that just worked perfectly. So I'm really looking forward to seeing her come back, even if it's just for uh, one movie, because you know, after winning the best, a best actress for uh, uh, you know Michelle Yeoh, she can write her own ticket now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm I'm glad that she loves the character enough that, because, I mean, she could appear in anything she wants now. She can write her ticket now for the foreseeable future. And I really love that she's going to come back to Star Trek and uh, reprise the role. Of course, yeah. she plays a badass, so she's got, like, complete freedom to do whatever <laughs> she wants to. It's like, you know, when Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, Ricardo Montalban actually was willing to come back and play Khan for free. He said, heck, I'll come back and play reprise the role and you don't even have to pay me. Because uh, <laughs> he was, he just wanted a chance to kind of break out of that Mr. Rourke fantasy island mode and just like in, indulge being the bad guy again. And he, he was and, great in that movie. He was chewing the scenery. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but but you know, of course, when he's balanced off by William Shatner, who also had a history of chewing up the scenery, the, yeah. it worked well. <laughs> the overacting worked very well. <laughs> and, Sh and Shatner, and Shatner's, you know, is usually portrayed as overacting, but he's actually pretty damn good. You know, he he he, he it appears to overact, but it actually works with him. It, sure. It just, sure. It's easy. To, it's easy to parody, you know. It's easy to parody <laughs> William Shatner being over the top. You know, yeah. It, it's like yeah. there's a there's an un there was a a failed TV pilot from the 1960s where you we have it where now it sounds like some of the most bizarre casting ever, uh, but at the time it wasn't didn't seem so ridiculous. Um, so it was a failed pilot to do a TV show on Alexander the Great, where Alexander the Great was played by William Shatner. <laughs> his uh, his comp companion and his best friend was played by Adam West. Interesting. I didn't know that. That's that's a nice detail. There's a reason that the, it didn't get picked up, but I mean, <laughs> I mean, you just think of them now in that role, and it's just in those roles, it's just like. Great Scott Alexander, we have to to the to the Greek cave. Yeah. <laughs> it, it just it's so bizarre now. It's like seeing seeing the Leslie Nielsen from the airplane movies and naked gun movies and some of his earlier roles where he played serious <laughs> characters. And you know, and if he's it's a serious movie halfway, you expect him to say, Surely you jest. And it's like I don't jest and stop calling me Shirley. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and I said, I mean, Jonathan Majors, man, he is, I really hope he gets to stay as, as Kang because it looks like he could really, really shine as it, but yeah. Well, I don't know if he's that, choking, if he's choke, beating and choking multiple women, I, I don't, Yeah. Should he, be, should he stay in that role? I don't no, know. No, no. If, 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 yeah. if the stuff is true or there's multiple accusers, they, he ha you can't keep him around. I, mean, I don't want to try him in the court of public opinion. I'd, I'd like to see the proof no, of it. But, but yeah, yeah, if you're having multiple, crit multiple accusers come forward, even if he's mm -hmm. cleared of the one that he's currently facing in New York, if you have multiple accusers, this goes on the level of like a Bill Cosby. Yeah. You know, where you, you just can't, you can't do it. Kevin Spacey, I mean, I, yeah, I like yeah, Kevin Spacey yeah, as Kevin. an actor. I mean. Yeah, Kevin uh, Spacey too. I mean, you, you know, you, there's some things that, you know, even though you, you know, 
can argue that the scales aren't equal. I mean, you know, uh, does, and I'm not saying there's any equivalency, but you look at um, uh, John, what might happen to Jonathan Majors and then you compare it to like Deshaun Watson. One guy ha might have his career destroyed. The other one gets a $240 million guaranteed contract. So, I mean, kind of, you know, it's not the same deed, but still it, it's pretty significant in yeah. terms of what they were doing. And, it's kind yeah. of difference of outcome, you know? Yeah. I'm not saying that Jonathan Major should be excused or anything. It's just, you, you people look at it and go, um, wait, wait, what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah. And I was saying jokingly that Jonathan Major should have been an NFL quarterback. He'd be okay then, that's fine, you know? <laughs> but that's a commentary on, sarcastic comment on the Deshaun Watson <laughs> fiasco yeah yeah well then also right so many people are making money off of those players uh yeah. but you know for jonathan uh majors man, I mean, he's identified with that character uh yeah you yeah. know i i i don't want to i don't really want to see a movie with somebody who's done these kinds no. of things yeah. no so, yeah i i think he's i think unless things take a uh, miraculous turn um it, they're probably going to have to recast him i mean you can't get yourself into an ezra miller situation here yeah you i know. think he's young enough to be recast and, okay, might, you know, might be and able to pull out of it but yeah it's weird right or, or just justin Moreland and rick and morty and, yeah um, yeah it, a lot i think is going to depend on what happens on his hearing at may 8th um there's yeah. just so many different stories going on right now. There's things that are mutually contradictory. There's stuff that makes absolutely no logical sense when you think about it. There's different stories that are contradictory from reliable sources. And so, yeah, it, it's, uh, I think we just have, kind of have to wait and see because there's just too damn many rumors going on now. There's too many different sides to the story and you know let's wait till some public hearings and let's see what happens sure but sure. you know i do i do think that you know that marvel studios and disney i think are going to do be wiser than the old management of warner brothers mm -hmm. and they're going to nip this stuff in the bud um and as much as I would love to see Jonathan Major say, I'm like, I'm, I'm a huge fan of him. I, I love Lovecraft Country. Um, yeah, I thought yeah. he was great in, at the end of Loki season one. I thought he was good in Ant-Man and the Wasp. I want to see him continue to develop his talent. Sure. But, you know, there's, you know, he, if he did what he did, it's alleged, then no. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's unfortunate, but you know, I, like I said, with I do the equivalent of Bill Cosby. I I was a huge Bill Cosby fan growing up. I when yeah, he was here in, here in the Valley in the cot and performing, my wife and I went to see him. Okay. Um, but after everything, he, after it came out, what he did, I have never, I haven't listened to any of his comedy. I haven't watched any episodes of the Cosby Show, and I never will. And, and that's did you think that he's coming back with something that he's going to have some kind yeah. of a show? No, no. He, he announces I mean, it, I, but I honestly doubt anybody's going to give him the I time hope of day. Not, <laughs> I hope why not. would anybody put money in his pocket? It's sad yeah. because he's he was a he was a very talented individual, very very funny, a great actor, but sure. And a trailblazer. I mean, like those early comedy albums are yeah, classics that inspired tour. most modern comedians. Yeah. Bill Cosby and, plans comedy tour in 2023. <laughs> Good luck. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You'll, be, you'll, you'll be playing the crickets chirping. Uh, <laughs> you'll have more people seeing case. Morbius than. Uh, <laughs> he's just trying. I don't know if it's going to happen. It's, yeah. He it's announces hoping, it. Good, good, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, yeah. 
people announce stuff all the time um, and doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. Hey, I'm really willing to star in movies and then nobody signs you up for a movie, you're out of luck. <laughs> I mean, maybe you appear in real bad B-grade movies, but... <laughs> what then you would even receive that show? Or... Yeah. I don't see it. I don't know. But I, I think hopefully we will be able to enjoy a very good Guardians of the Galaxy 3. Uh, we'll have Secret Invasion, which promises to be very good. And I mean, who, who doesn't look forward to seeing Samuel L. Jackson kick ass as Nick Fury? <laughs> and the Marvels looks really good. Um, you know, we've got the yeah. Fantastic Four coming up. Um, I'm excited about that. There's, there's just a lot of really good projects that'll be coming up. Uh, plus Avengers 5, Kang Dynasty, whoever ends up playing, playing, playing Kang, uh, and Secret Wars, introduction of Doctor Doom eventually, whether it be later or sooner. The Beyonder. Yeah, Galactus. The Beyonder is a lot like Q. Somebody was just talking about Q, right? Yeah. yeah. Beyonder and Q yeah. are almost Q identical. Steroids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, for... And, for the bozos on on YouTube who say Marvel is doomed. <laughs> if Marvel puts out like 30, 15 bad movies in a row, okay, I'll agree. You know, if they start doing DC extended universe numbers, yeah, I'll agree. But it's Marvel, like people say rock is dead, you know. It doesn't yeah. die yeah. just because you want it to die. <laughs> I mean, they, they keep on saying it time after time after time, and it's like Guys, it's going to take a lot more. Uh, it's much more likely that DC is going to uh, fall apart if Superman Legacy doesn't do well, the first movie in the new DC universe. Um, then Marvel's, as I said, has a lot more money in the bank with fans before um, everything falls apart. Well, uh, I, I I think I'm I'm optimistic for DC simply because I think it was a smart decision to hire you know James Gunn simply yeah, because yeah. you know he did a really basic thing but an important thing right create stories that had a more upbeat tone I, I really didn't like how yeah, the DC it, films that were so dark um the, the just even just the way Batman. Zack Snyder was shooting these was movies so cool. was murky yeah. and and like. A sense of humor, a sense of playfulness. It, That's what it, makes comic books fun um, and makes comic book stories fun. You take that out of it. Uh, I don't know if you're going to get what you want. I mean, there's there's a place in Marvel yeah. for, you know, the Punisher and Moon Knight and Morbius. and what, But but you also have to have kind of the playfulness of a Spider-Man and um, kind of the upbeat yeah. quality of Superman. And I, I feel like some of the core elements of these characters are, have been ignored by people at DC. I, and, you know, like I like the Joker movie, of course, the mm -hmm. one with uh, Joaquin Phoenix. But, but you know, I, but that's because... Right, they took a few risks with that movie, right? Yeah. And, and uh, a Suicide Squad, I think, was a lot of fun um, and managed to, you know, capture a little bit of that sort of anti-heroic vibe that Deadpool yeah. has, and uh, you know, and I. I so I, I think that those projects are more interesting to me, and yeah. uh, I'm optimistic I, that they can change things. Yeah, I think James Gunn can succeed. The question is, is he going to have time to succeed? Yeah. You've got a deeply divided fan base that desperately needs to have some way to be unified. And it doesn't help when you have a, you know, seemingly a lot of efforts to alienate Zack, alienate Zack Snyder's fans who are a very passionate percentage of DC fans. And plus you have Discovery owning Warner Brothers now that has, you know, doesn't have a lot of margin for error and at least the way they've de behaved so far i I'm, I'm just not sure that the executives are going to stick with it long term i mean they had one direction going with black adam that didn't work they pulled the plug um and they go in an entirely new direction and you know they kind of uh you know really kind of you know 
reacted strongly to Shazam's failure. So, you know, what happens if the Flash, uh, you know, falls apart? If Superman yeah. Legacy tanks, I'm not sure that the David Zasloff, although he's done a lot of good there, is going to stick with it. No, maybe if you I, have. A I, I don't know why they keep doing like these reboot story. Like you know, why do we have to see eight yeah. origin stories for a character? I mean, you yeah. know, like just and, like progress the story for God's sake. <laughs> you know, what I mean, in the comic books, right? You're not getting a reboot yeah. every year of, of yeah, Batman. and I like, think it's been several, but yeah. I mean, and I think that's the the difficulty that James Gunn comes into. He's got the background to build a really successful comic book universe, but. Unlike the MCU, which was just, you know, built from the ground up, the DCU has all kinds of history behind it. And it, it's going to be tough. To, I I'm just don't have a lot of confidence that the executives and the company are going to back him up. Now, I have seen some good signs out there. For example, uh, Mike Flanagan. Uh, who did The Haunting of Hill House and The Haunting of Bly Manor. And uh, Midnight Mass expressed a desire to do a Clayface movie for DC. Um, the Batman villain, the uh, directors of the Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame, the Russo brothers, want to direct, apparently, a Batman film. Andy Muschietti, the director of The Flash and the It films, might, does, wants to potentially do the next Justice League film. If you have a lineup of really good directors in the hopper, you know, that might give them a little bit more time to work with. If you have like, even if Superman Legacy doesn't work, if you have Batman the Brave and the Bold directed by the Rousseau brothers, um, that can give you that time that you need. But if they don't grab onto it, like I was saying yesterday, if I heard the Russo brothers want to do a Batman film, I'm on the phone to him saying, dude, let's do a deal right now. <laughs> if I hear Mike Flanagan wants to direct a Clayface movie for the DC universe, I'm on the phone. Hey, Mike, let's make a deal. That's how they did in the animated Harley Quinn show with Clayface it was pretty funny. But yeah, does I anyone mean, really want a Clayface movie? Yeah. Well, if Maybe. Mike Flanagan wants to do it with the director of I his guess, talent, I guess, I'd like to see it. Yeah. I'd like to see it. Yeah, I mean... Is I, anyone, isn't I'm, he supposed to do those Dark Tower adaptations? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's got a TV series deal with Amazon, but I think he still has the ability to kind of direct individual movies. Mm -hmm. But his production company owns the Dark Tower, so he's taking, he's developing that slowly. Because he need, he wants to make sure he gets it right this time. Yeah. yeah. Sure. sure. Okay. Well, we've gone an hour and forty five minutes, so I think uh, it's time. <laughs> thanks to for being part of the endurathon. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for everybody who st stuck with us. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, Sorry, it's fun. I as much as I'm thanks for not joining us. Familiar with all of the characters, or but David well, said. And there's so many the they're always new ones too yeah yeah i know so it's tough keeping track of all these different char <laughs> different characters it's you know and it's you know especially with like some of the newer ones but i mean that that's you know that's cool with uh you know it with it being work like um a lot of i haven't collected dc so if there's going to be like any after like late last year, if they use storylines from more recent ones, I probably won't be familiar with them if it's like in the future. And that's a whole other topic of giving up DC print comics, but. Um, uh, oh, yeah, to talk about it someday because <laughs> he has a big collection, so. Yeah, well, I have done uh, things on DC comics before, but we'll see how it, uh, uh, shakes out the American print comic industry has a lot of problems right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a lot of problems. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, Japanese... I, you know, I, I think I, I, I'm glad that we were able to, you know, it's, it's fun to, to talk uh, about these projects. And I, I think, um, you know, I know that a, a lot of the population, a lot of our students like these things, too. And yeah. uh, I, 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 I'm glad that, uh, you know, uh, there is a little bit of a conversation about these things that takes them a little bit more seriously. I right? you know, I, I, I mean, yeah. David and I have talked about this before. Liana and I have talked about it. But people are so quick to dismiss um, the these movies is just like pulp entertainment or something that's not worth uh, spending a little bit of time thinking about. And I've never felt like that since I was a little kid to the present. I, I, I love Robin Hood. I love King Arthur. I like Shakespeare, but I also like Spider-Man and I, I, I like Batman. And I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. Right? You can tell good stories. These characters yeah. are going to be studied academically in the future. I mean, that's just the sure. way. Um, they already are. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's just you know. Yeah, go to um, the culture conference. You'll see yeah, panel yeah. after panel I mean, on all these characters. What, what's considered yeah. canon now, uh, it was at one point popular culture in the past. Yeah, Shakespeare in his day was popular culture. I mean, Absolutely. Shakespeare was not writing saying. Oh, someday, 600 years from now, English <laughs> academics are going to think I'm the greatest writer ever. He was writing. Yeah, he wasn't writing. Well, he, the professors he, knew at was Oxford. Yeah. he knew that he was going to last. I mean, in his sonnets, he says, you know, people are going to remember me as long as there are people to read. Yeah. Well, he might have happened I to be read. right, but. And for know, him, it was. Uh, right. He was. But he was still doesn't writing. Doesn't work out for everybody. He was writing his plays to make a living. I yeah. mean, it's not like he was just saying, I'm going to write something that's so obscure that people only 500 years from now will appreciate me. <laughs> no, Same those were the movies at the time. Yeah. The, the big Sex and they... violence. That's what Shakespeare was into, Bob right? Foster's, that's what, you know, yeah. still Ed sells Logan today. Right? So, yeah. yeah. Same thing with uh, Charles Dickens in his day. You know, they sure. they were published publishing to, uh, you know, yeah, make weekly. a living. Weekly and people used to pick on Stephen King, but I think people recognize Stephen King, right? Like when, right, when we were going to school, David, uh, right? Like uh, mm -hmm. if my teachers, some of my teachers saw me reading Stephen King, they'd be like, why are you reading that crap? Like, why don't you read something <laughs> yeah. more? I, I, but I think that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not, you know, I don't love everything from writer. Stephen he King, but I think that he's, writing. he's I mean, taken he seriously. Skilled. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll end with very, this there. There. The uh, late mm -hmm. literary character, uh, I got this story told to me many years ago about Stephen King and the literary, late literary crit critic Harold Bloom, that was apparently he was invited to address a bunch of like a lot of these highfalutin academic authors who kind of, or authors who write for academics like Thomas Pynchon and Don DeLillo uh -huh. and all Big those that kind of focus mm -hmm. on academic type audiences. And he literary. was in front of them and he was mm -hmm. saying, you know, a hundred years from now, nobody will be reading your work. They'll be looking at Stephen oh, King. Oh, oh. And I would, I would I love to true. have, I like those guys. <laughs> I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to see the look on their faces when, uh, you know, somebody of uh, Don DeLillo of uh, Harold Bloom's uh -huh. credibility was saying that I would just like, oh, to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> well, um, I hope that's not true because I like those authors well, too. But I, there's room for Donald Barthelme and Don DeLillo and Pynchon yeah, think, and even the House of Literature. I think there's yeah. all room for all of them. It's just yeah. Uh, yeah. it was also a message to the academics of the world that hey, uh, yeah. what's popular culture now is going to become great literature, considered great literature in the future. Yeah, and I think and yeah. time will tell which ones, but. That's yeah. the yeah. issue is quality. That's what yeah, yeah. What, what stands out, what's really good, what what communicates with yeah. audiences as a film, as a story. Uh, and yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, th there's still standards, right? But uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the genre, I don't think it matters that much, right? Yeah, and I think the MCU films will stand the test of time. And I mean, and even Shakespeare had a few dogs in his. Uh, <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> Yeah. I don't like two gentlemen from Verona, for yeah. example. I couldn't get through it. Henry the Sixth, <laughs> parts one through three, you know. <laughs> Only the Falstaff <laughs> parts are cool. Yeah. Yeah. For, the, for the brilliant brilliance of Henry the Fifth and Richard the Third, we then have the three parts of Henry the Sixth, which are like the tortures of the damn. <laughs> I never even read that one. <laughs> <laughs> 
I couldn't. No. <laughs> he only looked at parts of those. Yeah. 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 Well, so hey, I mean, it's it great seeing everybody. Yep. Thank you for attending. Okay. Well, thank you for everybody watching. Have a great weekend. Yeah, everybody. Thank, th thanks Enjoy for hanging out with us. Right. It's good talking to all of you. Bye. Yep. Good talking. Bye.